I'm John Affleck. I am the department head for journalism at, here at Penn State, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the OIDA lecture um, on journalism ethics. Um, tonight, we are really, really excited um, because we have Todd Zwillick with us, um, who has some really interesting and provocative views about the role of journalism uh, in our country today. And uh, so we're going to hear from him. I'm going to um, give you a little introduction. He's going to speak for a little bit. He's got obviously he's got some uh, some visuals that uh, he'll he'll show you, and then he'll be uh, he'll will he'll do some Q and A. And um, uh, our Foster Professor of Practice and Michigan State of Michigan Journalism Hall of Famer. Walter Middlebrook will uh, will speak to him. Uh, so uh, Todd comes to us from Hershey, Pennsylvania. So he's he's one of our own. Um, he uh, he graduated from McGill University, which is a beautiful school up in uh, Montreal. And um, coming out of of McGill, he sort of wrote kind of um, medical health technical articles that ultimately worked its way into writing for the Reuters wire service being published in Science, which is a really big deal. It's one of the, the two main scientific publications in the United States. And he's been the host of The Takeaway on public radio for a number of years. Um, uh, he also has written a book that's been a bestseller on, uh, on Audible called the man who knew the way to the moon about an engineer who basically overcame sort of institutional um, groupthink and just bureaucracy and grinding to a halt, not thinking very creatively and really played a critical role in getting the, the United States to the moon. Um, Todd's now the vice president, uh, the, sorry, the uh, deputy, deputy bureau chief. <laughs> It said vice, right to president uh, of Vice News, uh, which is which is a really cool um, news organization uh, online, uh, and he's the deputy uh, bureau chief in, in Washington. So, without further ado, um, let's hear from Todd and uh, listen to what he's got to say, and then then Walter will take us from there. Thank you. Good to have. Thank you. Good. John, thank you so much for that. And thanks to all of you for coming out. I know the weather sucks. I appreciate you being here. Those of you who are here for the extra credit, congrats. Those of you who are here because you want to be, uh, good. I'm glad you're here. Uh, but all of you, I'm glad you're here. I want to keep this relatively short. I don't want to talk at you for 90 minutes. I don't think that that'll be fun. I, I'd like for you guys to feel free to raise your hand, speak out. I'm not here to like talk at you one way. You hear something that piques your interest, you have a question, you have a comment, get in there, you'll get no objection from me. That's what we're here for, so please do that. Um, as, uh, as Professor Affleck said, I am from Hershey. I'm happy to be here. Not only that, my dad was a professor at this university for more than 20 years at the medical school in Hershey at uh, Milton S. Hershey Medical School, Penn State Medical Center. Um, so it's a special honor for me to be invited um, to come and talk to you guys, so, so thanks again for that. Um, I started out covering science and medicine ever since then I've covered politics and elections. And um, I don't think it's news to any of you that we're in a really weird time. We're in a really challenging time, not only in this country, but especially for journalism. What I'm going to talk to you about is my area of expertise, political journalism. So as we're, I have a couple of examples I'm going to put up. Obviously, you saw struggling with the AV, which is working now. Um, most of my reference points are going to be about covering our politics, really covering Trump and Trumpism, because that's the dominant force in our politics right now. So put your head in that space. I know you're interested in a lot of things. Um, I know sports journalism is huge at Penn State, and uh, I'm all for it. My world is sort, of, is sort of politics, elections, Washington stuff. Even if it's not your bag, think about how we cover that. Think about how journalists cover that. Think about what it means to be an unbiased journalist, because that's really what I want to cover. All right, so I'm going to start you off with a statement. Again, put your, put your mind in the political journalist uh, 
frame of mind. So here's my statement. I want you to think about it. You can react to it. Tell me what you think about it. Here's my statement. American democracy is under threat. Republicans are the ones threatening it. Say that one more time. It's a journalist talking to you now, a reporter. American democracy is under threat. Republicans are the ones threatening it. So what does that statement mean? Anyone, yell it out. Does, what does it say to you? Go ahead. It's blaming Republicans for threatening democracy. Blaming them. Okay. Good. Anybody else? Is that statement biased? It is. Yes. It's biased. Why is it? Who said yet? Yeah, why is it biased? Okay, that, that's an opinion, not informational value. Anybody else? Okay, so good. So two reactions, it's, it's opinion and it's a biased statement. Uh, what does it mean? How important is it for a political journalist to be neutral? Neutral, what is new, not a neutral is important. What does neutral mean? Both sides, I love it. That's a super important phrase, both sides. Anybody else? What does neutral mean? What does neutral say? If I tell you I'm neutral, what am I asking of you? Go ahead. Just kind of there. Mm -hmm. well, I take both sides equally. Go ahead. Um, I have a question. Yes. So you're a, like, a political journalist. Yes. So if you do stand, like, I'm not sure of your stance, but if you do stand neutral, how do you like how does the audience know that you have a strong voice if you're saying like I don't choose either side? It's an excellent question. We're about to get there. Thank you for that because you're thinking exactly in the right lines. Okay. If I say that I'm neutral, you're my audience. All right. You're not students anymore. You're my audience. You're my readers. You're my my viewers. If I tell you I'm neutral, what am I saying to you? What am I asking of you? I'm neutral. What do I want you to think about me? What am I saying to you? Not invested in the outcome, go ahead. Okay. To a wider audience. If I tell you I'm neutral, really what I'm saying is, trust me, trust me, right? That's what that means. You're, no matter what your political leanings are, you like this person, that person, you vote that way, that way, you can trust me because I am neutral. You can trust me not to favor one side or another side. And neutrality sometimes interchanged with the term objectivity, if you like. They're a little different, but for right now, I think they're probably synonymous enough. Neutrality or objectivity for a long, long time has been one of the, has been the currency of political journalism, not taking a side, not taking a stand. And you might cover politics, you go on the campaign trail, the Republican candidates are saying this, the Democratic candidates are saying that, you can just sort of report neutrally about what they're saying and voters can decide. So what happens when one side checks out of the arrangement of American politics? What happens when one side in the political fight decides that things like elections or basic democracy or telling the truth don't matter anymore? What happens when that three-legged stool, it's kind of a three-legged stool if you think of it this way, right? Political party, public, press, stands firmly on three legs. When once, what happens when one of those legs gets kicked out? What does it mean then to be neutral? What does it mean to be neutral when one side decides to weaponize the press, to call the press the enemy of the people, to use this as a political strategy so that no one will believe what the press writes in the first place. Where am I if I take a neutral position between that and another political party that really hasn't changed all that much? I'm not telling you to like them or dislike them. This isn't about a qualitative judgment on parties. So when one of the parties decides that this relationship is a weapon and that disinformation is a weapon, and the other side is pretty much doing what they've always done, little differences, but more or less doing what they've always done. What does it mean to be neutral between those two things? What does it mean to be neutral between uh, two different political philosophies versus between lies and 
some semblance of the truth. That's about as much as I can give a politician. What does it mean if I'm neutral between truth and lies? What am I doing if I'm neutral between truth and lies? Am I serving my readers? If I stay neutral or I'm afraid of being biased between one side weaponizing my industry, weaponizing what I bring to readers, and another side pretty much doing politics the way they've always done it, am I doing my job? So let me give an example. I want to give an example of how this can operate in practice. And take it back to 2019. This is a campaign trail. This is a report from local news station, I think in Wisconsin. Donald Trump went to Green Bay, Wisconsin, gave a rally stop, um, talked to his supporters. It was a campaign. He wanted to get elected president. And this is a local news report on Trump's appearance. Donald Trump is back at the White House this morning after stopping by the Badger State this weekend. This is him stepping off the plane in Green Bay yesterday evening. The president touched on several topics while here. Our Charles Benson reports from Green Bay. Thousands packed the rest said they're wearing their red hats in support of Donald Trump, saying they want to see him in the White House for another four years. For nearly 90 minutes, President Trump fired up the Green Bay crowd with lines like this. We're training the Trump, but are we having a good time or what? But he also played up his record on the economy, a key issue with voters, saying wages are up, unemployment is down. And we're now the number one economy anywhere in the world, and it's not even close. But he made no mention of one of his favorite subjects, Foxconn, a company he helped bring to Wisconsin. Trump promised to go after Democrats on the Green Deal, late-term abortions, and immigration and push back on Democrats pushing for more investigations. Democrats put all their hopes behind their collusion delusion, which has now been totally exposed to the world as a complete and total fraud. Semi-retired Trump supporter Todd Evers wore his POTUS 45 jersey. All right, we don't need to hear from that guy. Um, I show you that. Does anybody have an impression of what of that report? Not not the not the politician, but the report. Anything about it? The uh, guy with the microphone uh, was starting the interview with the reporter. Mm -hmm. He uh, was very animated, and it seemed like it could have been for a sports coverage event, something that was political. He was yelling at the mic. He seemed pretty animated. Yeah, well, he knows how to engage his viewers. Pretty good, actually. I got to say that I thought that part of the performance was. Um, yet see, politics, a lot of people glaze over, especially around campaign time. That guy staring right down the barrel, and right, it could have been a hockey game. I think it was a hockey arena, you know. So, yeah, pretty good job there. Anything else about it? My impression of that report is it was very normal. It's a normal report on a normal campaign stop. The candidate was in town. The candidate went after his opponents on abortion and immigration. The candidate went after his opponents on investigations. Our community was visited by the candidate. Goodbye. Great report. So, from watching that report, Pretty neutral, I have to say. I don't think that the I don't think that, that reporter really took much of a side, but gave a report on a very normal camp, campaign stuff. So here's what Donald Trump actually said at that campaign stop. I'm not sure. I'm let me see if I'm queued up. Here we go. All right, there this will work. I hope. I'm only going to give this one more second, then I'm going to wing it because I, okay. So that journalist gave a pretty normal, straightforward campaign stop report. What Donald Trump actually said at that rally, and I'm paraphrasing, he said that women and their doctors give birth to a baby. They cradle the baby together and decide whether or not to execute it. That's what he said. He called law enforcement officials who were investigating law enforcement officials who he had purged from the Justice Department when he was president. He called them scum who were dishonest and are now running for the hills. Now, this is after his own purge of the Justice Department. And he said that they were now sending illegal immigrants to sanctuary cities and that that was a sick idea that he came up with. He invented that idea. So that's how the rally really went. 
Does that bear any resemblance to the report that you saw? So I show you that to say that sometimes, often, neutrality, what you think of as neutrality, can actually miss the story. It can miss the story by miles and miles. The story is that the candidate got up in front of a rally, told innumerable lies, innumerable lies, vicious lies, in fact, um, described law enforcement officials who he had purged as scum, told false stories about abortion that women cradle babies and then murder them. There's absolutely no evidence of that, for, uh, as far as I'm aware. Um, and uh, what was the last one? And said that he invented the idea of sending immigrants to sanctuary cities false. Those are just three that I picked out, just three. Um, if you're familiar with the campaign style of Donald Trump, you could probably find 40 more. Now, I'm not telling you this to beat up on Donald Trump. I'm telling you this to look at the journalism. Of that report that we just watched, which was probably recreated 40 or 50 or 60 times around America and thousands of times during the campaign, because the political journalist goes to the campaign event, reports neutrally on just sort of what happened, never takes a side. What happens when describing accurately and to the letter what actually happened sounds so unhinged and so outlandish that your audience thinks you're biased by saying so? What does neutrality mean then? You have to challenge yourself about what the notion of neutrality means. Not be dishonest, not put your thumb on the scale, but understand how neutrality can be weaponized, not against you, the reporter, but more importantly, against your audience. That reporter is a pro. He's got a great delivery. He went and did his job. His producer, his editor said, Brian, great job. You reported. And he completely missed the story. Missed it 100%. Missed it. That was not a normal campaign stop. That was uh, really a string of outlandish statements, um, false statements, lies, in fact. So, so I had to wing that now. What about the New York Times? Those of you who've worked at the Times, apologies. No hate on the New York Times. I love them. Read them every day. Um, but let's look at some of the coverage in some of our vaunted, most important political journalism outlets. Here's a report from the Times right after that very same rally, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, Trump repeats false claim that doctors execute newborns. I think I just told you about that claim. But look at the lead that the Times chose here. President Trump revived on Saturday night what is becoming a standard and inaccurate refrain about doctors executing babies. That's the lead. An inaccurate refrain. So what the New York Times, the New York Times pros, again, no hate on the New York Times, but let's let's be I'm happy for them to be critical of me. I'm sure they I'm sure they are sometimes. Um, look at the way the New York Times themselves, they're telling you that a lot of false things were said. They're telling you that maybe um, local Fox 5 or whoever that reporter was, that maybe he might have missed the mark. But the lead says that he used what is becoming a standard and inaccurate refrain. I'm not sure that I would agree that doing the best for my viewers and my readers describing that rally would mean describing telling people that women and their doctors give birth to a baby, cradle it, and to decide whether or not to execute it in an accurate refrain. Why are they using that phrase? They didn't do it by accident. They're pros. They're the pros. The reporter, the editors, they know what they're doing. They're good at their jobs. They made a decision to use an accurate refrain. Why? I think you might know why. Less harsh than saying he lied. Less harsh than saying he lied. It's, it's got nice round edges, doesn't it? It's got nice, it doesn't have any hard edges, you're right, less harsh. I think they are protecting themselves a little bit, protecting themselves um, from what we covered at the top, a claim of bias, an accusation of bias. Um, somebody might accuse them of being against Trump or against his supporters by describing accurately what was actually said. They are reporting that he's saying false things, no, no doubt, so I'm, we're not we're not uh, that critical of them. But that language is, is why we're here. We dissect the language, we examine the language, we use our words and use our reporting to accurate, accurately reflect what's happening in our politics. So 
inaccurate refrain. Actually, let me let me try this out. Is there anybody? Feel free to jump in. Like, is there anybody here who thinks that's the right way? I probably should have asked this before um, I went on my thing because you're going to think like I'm going to be mean to you, but I'm not. What, what do you guys think about the use of the term inaccurate refrain after having watched? Um, you didn't get to watch Trump's performance, but I told you what it was because my thing wasn't queued up. What do you think about inaccurate refrain? I'm going to speak that. Please. A little bit AP, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, my doesn't imply intent. It's it says lie. The very definition of it means someone intended to say something false. And I think journalists certainly get a little hinky about asserting that somebody made a false statement. Really. I don't. I don't disagree with that lie. If if I say you've lied, I I have. I'm imbuing intent on you. You know that what you're saying is false, but you're saying it anyway. Um, maybe in this case, maybe Donald Trump believes. Maybe he does believe that babies are born. They have a discussion and they murder the baby. Maybe he does believe that. I don't think so, but maybe he does. Go ahead. So if there was redundant evidence that was available to the public that said one thing and somebody still came out and said another thing, could you then say that they lied? Stay tuned for the grand jury investigation of the coup attempts, because this is going to be one of the questions uh, about Donald Trump's state of mind, what he knew or should have known uh, when he launched an effort to stay in public, stay in office, thinking that the election had been stolen. Did he really believe it? Could he have believed it after being told by 90 people around him that it wasn't true? Um, I would think that it's more of a protective matter, being the far side, so he doesn't want to compromise, but in the same way, to who their audience is and how you're speaking and portraying a certain opinion or view. Obviously, the Times knows their audience. So if saying an accurate refrain might be more digestible thing for us as the audience to read, even though we obviously can refer more, um, I think that that allows them to have that bigger role not only it's not being seen by the Trump's part, um, party as a whole. Um, then, how does the audience digest that that framing mm -hmm. super important thank you for that super important where did we start with the idea of neutrality when i say i'm neutral what am i saying to you i'm saying trust me right trust me you can trust me because i'm not on a side you can trust me because i don't have a dog in this fight you can trust me because they're fighting it out. I'm just here to tell you what happened. Okay. So that is a very, that's a super important um, uh, consideration because that phrase says, trust me. I'm not here to call it a lie. Now, there are a lot of ways to approach what those statements are besides the binary of lie or inaccurate refrain. There's a long distance between those things. And maybe we don't have to go over it. I'm sure you guys can think through other ways to describe what that statement is without presuming to be in his head. Does he know he's lying? I don't know. You're right. I don't know that. But I do know, at least I'm pretty confident in my judgment, this is just me, that an accurate refrain doesn't accurately describe to the reader what that was. And the New York Times has a motivation to sand those edges. And I think you just hit on exactly what it is. Trust me, the bid for trust. Um, that phrase, the bid for trust, I didn't invent it. I didn't invent this idea. Um, I encourage you, it's, um, it's out there. There's a very, very important and interesting um, debate on political journalism going on right now. I encourage you to read the writings of Jay Rosen media critic and professor at NYU. He writes the Press Think blog. He writes a lot about the bid for trust. He, write a lot, he writes a lot about political journalists' brains um, and, um, and what this current politics does to our brain circuits. He says the politics of Trump, not just Trump, the politics of 
2020 to 2030 um, national politics is frying the circuits of American political reporters. We used to say, and I've been around long enough, unfortunately, to know this decades ago in political journalism, we used to say, I'm neutral. This guy says the tax rate should be 39%. This gal says the tax rate should be 34%. Me, I don't have a view on the tax rate. I'm just here to report on the debate. Um, now we're in a different paradigm. Now the paradigm says um, they're giving birth to babies. They're cradling those babies. They're murdering them. And that's what Democrats do. That's what Democrats want for America. And by the way, this guy, no matter what he does, he's lying because he's your enemy. Now, if I'm neutral in that discussion, neutral meaning, hey, I'm just, they said that, they said that. What have I told my reader? What have I told, what have I told my, my, um, my viewer? So I encourage you to read uh, Jay Rosen. He talks a lot about the bid for trust. He talks a lot about um, neutrality. And he talks a lot about um, how political journalism is frying the circuits of the American public. Just real quickly, how do I know that this weaponization of journalism is meant to make the public distrust us? How do I know that it's intended to upend this trust paradigm that we started with? I know because Donald Trump said so. I keep coming back to him because he's sort of the progenitor. He didn't invent all of this, but he's probably the right place to focus because he's the he's he's the one who's upended our game and he's running for office again and he might get it. So we're going to have to deal with it for another five years and beyond. How do I know that Donald Trump wants to destroy the bid for trust? Well, because he said so. Um, the show on CBS called 60 Minutes. Be surprised if you guys watch it all that much. The old ones do classic show, really good journalism. Um, one of the anchors on that show is named Leslie Stahl. She's been around for decades. She is a trusted and excellent television journalist for CBS. In 2015, during Trump's first campaign, Leslie Stahl, behind the scenes, this wasn't on camera, asked Donald Trump, said, hey, what's up with all the fake news? What's up with the fake news? Fake news, fake news, fake news, enemy of the people. Why don't you knock it off, Donald? Why do you say that all the time? And Wesson can be honest, very, very honest sometimes, turned to her and he said, I do it so that when you write negative things, no one will believe you. Google it right now, Leslie Stahl. I do it so that when people write negative things, when you write, when you people write negative things, no one will believe you. And I can't put it any better than that. So you have to think through that motivation, think through that statement and think through the cascade of strategies that come from it when you decide what your position is in the trust game. Um, so I don't want to go on too much longer because I want to get your questions and I want to um, sit down with Professor Middlebrook. But I do want to say that I have a view on the trust me statement and whether I ask my readers or viewers or listeners to trust me based on some idea of neutrality or on a different proposition. Um, I don't use the neutrality bid for trust. Um, I don't think it works anymore. I had to change my view on this. It wasn't easy, caused a lot of struggle. I think that some of my colleagues in Washington agree with me on this. I think many, many more struggle with it all day long. Um, I had a lot of other examples of people who struggle with it on the air to this day, and I didn't want to spend our entire evening dragging them. My bid for trust isn't pretending that I'm neutral. Not between Republicans and Democrats, not between conservatives and liberals. I'm not neutral between truth and lies. Or at least an attempt at the truth. And not all Democrats are truthful. That's not the, that's not the point. I'm not neutral between these two phenomena going on. That's not how I inform my readers. What I do, I write a newsletter every week. We call it Breaking the Vote. We have a whole reporting project at Vice News. Uh, we get a TV show. We do a newsletter every week. It's called Breaking the Vote. It's reporting on threats to democracy, political violence, the insurrection, the coup attempt, uh, accountability for the coup attempt, and January 6th, the multiple grand jury investigations going on. 
He covers all that stuff. I do it every week. What a mission statement when we launched that project. And the mission statement, I'm not going <laughs> to memorize the whole thing. It basically says um, where I started. American democracy is under threat. Trump's Republicans are the ones threatening it. That's a scary thing to say for a political journalist who's worked in Washington for many years. That's really, really scary. That feels weird to say. But what happens when you're asked to be neutral between truth and lies? What happens when you're asked to be neutral between authoritarianism and democracy? My answer to that, and again, I'm not alone in this, is to not pretend to be neutral, but to declare where I stand, declare where our outlet stands. And it says it in the mission statement. It doesn't say we're pro-Democrats. It doesn't say we're anti-Trump. It doesn't say we're anti-Republicans. Nothing like that. It's not the point. It says we are pro-voting, pro-democracy, and pro-truth. That's what we're for. That's the bid for trust. Here's where we're coming from not hiding behind a cloak of neutrality. I'm not pretending that I'm just over here with no voice, um, no critical thinking skills. I'm not a balls and strikes calling robot who doesn't know the difference between what's true and what's not true when I hear, uh, I hear a statement like they give birth to babies, cradle them, and then decide to execute them and then leave it out of my report because it just sounds too weird. Um, <laughs> That's not where I'm coming from. We are pro-democracy, pro-voting, and pro-truth. And so when you read us and you watch us, you'll know that if we're critical of people who are anti-voting, anti-democracy, you're going to know why. Regardless of party, we celebrate pro-democracy Republicans. Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, you've probably heard those names. We celebrate them. We criticize anti-democracy Democrats that exist in New York where they gerrymandered the heck out of their state. So that's the mission statement, and that's the bid for trust. It's a little bit different than the old one, which says, pretend I'm neutral so you can trust me. And I'll end on this. It's an old photo, 1960. Um, who's read a little bit of the history of the civil rights movement in this country? A little bit. All right, so some of you. So I don't expect you to know what this photo is. It's kind of an old one. That's okay. I'll explain it real quickly. This is a photo of a Woolworths lunch counter, 1960, Greensboro, North Carolina. These young men were among the first four young men who wanted to get lunch at that lunch counter and were not served. This is a protest. This was, I, I think this might've been the first day, although I'm not sure. The first day the four of them sat down, the second day, I think a couple dozen protesters joined the third day, several dozen protesters joined, and you may have heard of the famous lunch counter protests against segregation, North Carolina, 1960. So I like to imagine if I were assigned to cover that story, my editor said, go down to Greensboro, cover the lunch counter protest, bring me back the story. And I talked to the locals and I talked to these young men who I've had it with segregation and want to at least be served lunch at Woolworths. And my story said, Dateline, Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, February 2nd, 1960. These protests have started, sit-ins sit have started. These young black men are protesting segregation and want to eat lunch at a segregated lunch counter and could not get served. Other folks around town who I talked to said, we believe in states' rights and we don't want outsiders or the federal government telling us what to do. And those are the two sides, both sides. Who said both sides before? It's right, both sides is how you report a story. Now, if I reported that story and I said, these young men wanna eat lunch at this counter and want the right to get served at lunch in Greensboro and the white locals say, we believe in states' rights and we don't want outsiders telling us what to do. It's a pretty accurate story if you're reporting both sides. Did I get the story at all? Is that what this is about? Looking back on it now, and I like to look back on this now, what story would I have filed 
kind of like how I like to think about my coverage now when I'm retired or old or whatever, and I look back on how I covered this era, my era, this was way before my time. Please don't think that I was a reporter, by the way, when this was happening. I was not, way, way, way before my time. But for me, it's one of the most salient examples. I think about this when I look back on my time and my journalism now, and you'll have your time. If I had taken back the story about segregation versus we just want states, we believe in state sovereignty and we don't want outside, we don't want the federal government telling us what to do. Would I have had the story? I think I would have tragically and horribly and indefensibly missed the story if I was neutral and I reported both sides with no investment in what was actually true, right? with no moral core to what I was writing about. And I think I would regret it for the rest of my journalistic career. So I try to help that animate what I do now. Um, because a lot of people reported the story that we just talked about. A lot of people reported states' rights versus young black, young black people tired of segregation versus states' rights. They missed the story. They missed it tragically. So let's not do that. And that's where I'll end. And um, like for like for you guys to get involved and let's uh, let's talk about it. Go there, yeah. and, and I'm one of those kids that couldn't get it at the counter. I was around it. You had to go there. All right, everybody. This is the Q and A um, where we're going to talk about what Todd just talked about. And the first question I just want you to reiterate for me and make it clear what that three-legged chair was again. I'm sorry. The three-legged chair that you described in your your role. Yeah, I, it, it kind of it, the three-legged chair kind of shifts around for me. Sometimes you might say it's like Republicans, Democrats, and the press um, in political journalism, like press is in the middle. Let's go with that. I think I said the press, the, the consumers, the readers, and the politicians. I don't like that as much. I'll revise it and say, because we're talking about political journalism, uh, and I work in Washington, for better or for worse, Republicans, Democrats, and the press, and what happens when one of those legs gets kicked out. This was a clarified. Yeah. Okay. I changed it up a bit, but yeah. Okay. But the idea is that one of them falls on, on their face, the whole system goes kaput. If you invest in, if you don't have something more stable. Okay. If you don't have something more stable. Okay. Um, I'm going to be the antagonist here. Please. Why should I trust you? You should trust me because I declared for you at the beginning, before you read me, before you watch me, I tell you what I'm doing. No smoke and mirrors. There's no magic trick. There's no pretend neutrality where I pretend I'm neutral, but I really have an agenda, right? Um, for instance, I might tell you as a slogan every 17 minutes on my air that I'm fair and balanced. I might repeat it over and over and over that I'm fair and balanced. You might get it in your head that I'm fair and balanced. Am I really? As they say, you decide. Um, I try not to play that game. I try not to hide behind a cloak of neutrality. Our mission statement declares what we're for. I think it's good things to be for, and I'm willing to defend it. And um, you know, you take uh, you take a lot of incoming for it, especially in this environment online. I'm sure you can imagine um, what the incoming looks like being as critical as we are of uh, basically a political party that's been, that's been taken over by an authoritarian movement. But that's what's happened. That's, that's not on me as a journalist. That's on them. I'm going to keep telling my viewers and my readers to the best of my ability what exactly is happening. If that paints people in a bad light, makes them look awful, well, that's politics, as they say. That's why you should trust me, is because I tell you up front what I'm doing. My outlet tells you up front what we're doing, and we don't pretend otherwise. From a perspective now, uh, I'm, I'm a learning journalist. I'm trying to figure out what, what I'm supposed to do here. Using your argument, how is one to determine that your approach is the correct one 
because uh, I'm, I'm trying not to use the right left word here, but you're using your approach. Is that the correct way of approaching these stories? Who makes that determination? We, um, we don't have a president in journalism. We don't have a pope. We don't have a triumvirate that rules us. We have our collective judgment and we have our own judgment and our editor's judgment at, about doing our jobs and serving our readers and viewers to the very best we can. How do I know? I don't. Um, I have a, enough experience, I think, in political journalism in Washington, enough experience operating under the pressure of neutrality, wanting my readers or whatever I was doing at the time, my listeners, to think that I'm neutral. More, more important to the journalist often, if I'm too critical of one side, the politicians won't talk to me anymore. They see me writing nasty things about them. Their staff won't call me back. That's part of the pressure that they will put on me. Um, I've experienced all that in those pressures and what it means to sand down the edges and refer to uh, in an accurate refrain and why they do it. I know why they do it because I've done it. I did it for years. I did it for years with good reason. It's, you know, this is not like, this is not me sitting in judgment about the New York Times is wrong. This is a little bit of experience and me telling you from my professional experience, my job satisfaction, my personal satisfaction, and thinking that the information and the service that I'm providing to viewers and readers is meeting the moment, I'm sleeping pretty good right now. I'm sleeping pretty good. There's, there's uh, a lot of despair in this job because there's a lot of stuff that's really messed up about politics, about rhetoric, uh, about um, violence, racism, and the truth. A lot of it's messed up. I feel like this approach is a strong sense of mission, and I'm sleeping pretty well. And I think that's the best, that's the best I can do. Yeah. And please use a minute now to explain to us where vice fits in the spectrum of reporting and yeah. a news judgment. And vice, vice is, bills itself as a youth media platform. So online, especially our audience is young. I'm sure a lot of you watch vice on YouTube. Just, I'm not, pumping myself up, but you're young, so you probably watch it, you probably know it. Um, we're uh, growing fast on social media, on TikTok, really fast. We're trying to build an audience there. Um, we do documentary style television coverage, immersive television coverage. Um, most of these guys have probably seen it online. So youth, youth media is the billing. Our television show, Vice News Tonight, which is on actual TV, uh, I was surprised to learn that the, the standard viewer of that show is a 50 year old white man which surprised me but that's what the market research said doesn't mean other people don't watch that's the i guess if you're selling an ad on that that's who you are um so that's the that's the market on the media spectrum vice i think overall you describe it as left left of center for sure i think if you watch the editorial choices that we make at vice what we choose to cover the people we choose to cover the experiences we choose to cover i think most people would probably view that as left of center oriented. We don't think of it that way. We think of it as youth oriented, what our audience wants to watch, what they're interested in, what's important to them, and the experiences that we want to, that we want to platform. Um, but I think it's fair to say it's viewed as, as left of center, as, a, as an overarching, you know, if you said, where's Fox? Okay, they're right of center, obviously. You'd have to be honest and say that the advice is left of center. Just making sure. Yeah. How many of you have even seen or know something about ICE? Just make sure we're on the same page. No, no, no. Okay. So you said a reporter, I don't even say like yourself, we have to trust. How does a reporter develop that trust with an audience? <laughs> well, the most important, uh, the most important way is accuracy, being right. Being right means checking your sources. Being right means double checking. Um, when you do analysis to make sure your analysis is strong and not frivolous. I do a lot of analysis these days, more than I do straight reporting. I did a lot of straight reporting earlier in my career, on the phone, checking the facts, looking in the, in the report, pretty straight ahead. 
um, when they season you a little bit and they start to round off the edges, you start to do more analysis. I guess they feel like you have the the position to do that. I'm not sure, but I do a little bit more of that. So, um, so earning trust means uh, being correct, not only in your facts, but in honest analysis. Here's what I really think. Here's the best of what I can tell you about what's what's really going on. And I think doing it consistently and repeatedly and soberly is the best way you can do it. Okay. And we're going to open this up to the floor now. Feel, feel free, and you guys can feel free to come in, of course. But I'm just trying to follow up on some of the things you started. And that raises the other question of you get to that point after a while in your career. You don't just start off. In a, the analysis and putting your opinion in your stories, when, is it, when does that kick in? How, when, when do we make that choice and when does it become legit that you can get away with that? I don't know. And I do. You're right. Because if you read what I write now, it's a long way from straight like AP headline, facts, 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 your editor redlining out anything that's, you know. Um, I use a lot of adjectives. I try to make it funny. There is some ridicule in it when I write. Um, Anybody who gives me their email address, I'll put you on the newsletter um, list. Come to your inbox on Friday mornings to see what I mean. Um, try to make it funny. It's snarky. You know, uh, that's for entertainment. That's to keep people reading an opening. I'm sorry to say it, but you got to keep them. You know, <laughs> politics is dry and boring. People are tired of reading about um, ugly stuff. And I feel like if I can bring the jokes, they'll keep reading. That's a little bit cheap, and it's exactly what we do. <laughs> You know, uh, that's exactly what we do. When does opinion enter into it? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think what I do now is part analysis. I think there is some opinion in it. I don't. I think I wouldn't be honest if I didn't tell you that I had some, that I've developed some contempt for people who refuse to tell the truth, for people who openly traffic in racism and misogyny and things that um, we some some peaks that we thought we mounted already in this country they're bringing us back to them on the other side i'd be lying if i said i didn't have a little bit of contempt for that i think it probably shows in what i write um not as inhibited as i was as a younger man to express that and um thanks to my outlet for letting me do it people seem to be interested in it so it's a mix it's a weird mixture i don't know what it is really and i'm i'm sort of okay with that too i don't know exactly what it is my writing it's part analysis it's part opinion it's part entertainment um, i will stand by that it's all true and if it channels a little bit of outrage it's not for a party and it's not for an ideology it's for anti-democracy i won't stand for it and I don't think any journalist should, not an American journalist. Glad you got there, because that's where I want to go next. Yeah. You start this conversation off with democracy is under attack. How do we restore democracy? Or, or break down this idea. Yeah. You report, 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 report. You get in people's face, you get on the phone, you get on the line, you get your questions answered, but you demand honesty and you at this very young stage in your career don't fall victim to fake neutrality it's a little bit hard i think probably if you're an undergrad right now and you have only ever really experienced politics like this it might be a little bit difficult to put aside what neutrality <laughs> between democracy and authoritarianism looks like please Please, I don't know how much you're going to be writing about politics, but in all things, even if you're writing about sports, get beyond the press release. We started this conversation with both sides. Purge it from your brain. Purge it. Both sides is a construct that is meant to constrain you as a journalist. It's meant to sand all of the edges off of your critical thinking skills. You know who understands both sides of a thing? A baseball umpire who calls balls and strikes. A robot can do that. And they shortly will be doing it. Shortly. Won't be long before we have robots calling balls and strikes. Mm -hmm. You're better than that. We're all better than that. And the world doesn't need more umpires. The world needs critical thinking journalists. Both sides is your cage. The truth yeah. is where you want to be. And that's probably the best thing I can tell you. Okay. I'm a young journalist. But yeah, again, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Oh, you go for it. Hi, I'm a 
You have raised a whole other night that we should have that I should only be a small part of, not the center of attention, on objectivity. I mentioned it a little bit in the beginning. We talked mostly about neutrality. Objectivity came up. What does objectivity mean? And the definition of that word is under change right now in journalism, and rightfully so. Objectivity used to mean um, the sort of the, the removed kind of neutral voice on the TV news at night. Walter Cronkite is an old guy who used to be on the news every night. He used to say, that's the way it is. That was his catchphrase, his sign off. And that's what it meant. This is the way it is. And when you dig a little bit below that catchphrase for America, that's the way it is. That's the way it is came from a 50 year old white guy for decades, told America, that's the way it is. That was the definition of objectivity. So what objectivity is, what it means to be objective about a story in newsrooms is changing fast and for the better. This is why it's so important that um, newsrooms as fast as possible become more diverse, more representative, more representatives of marginalized communities, people of color, women, they used to all look like me. They are better, just better. They're better when they look like everybody because those are the readers and that is the country. That's as objective an answer as I can give you. New, the news is better, newsrooms are better, and coverage is better when the people doing the work have more honest perspectives. And guys like, bless him, Walter Cronkite, whatever, he's a hero. Uh, I'm glad. Um, I will never take him out of the Journalism Hall of Fame. Uh, old folks love him. But um, good riddance to that being the measure of, objective, of objectivity uh, for American news. It's changing, not fast enough. That's a whole other, like, have a whole other night on Jade's question. It's a whole thing. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to mention, you talked about sort of uh, about the Green Grove in North Carolina, that if you were to report it, the people sitting in the bar uh, protesting, or the gay food protesting, and also the people who have. Um, I want to talk about yourself specifically, um, looking back at your career, what would be your uh, saying of, because everyone has their thoughts, everyone, you missed a story. What has been your worst story that you've missed in terms of reporting? And you're like, oh, I did not hit it up the nail on the head. There are so many that it's hard to think of one. When I think of all the stories I wrote as a younger reporter on Capitol, you spent decades, I spent a long time covering Capitol Hill, like ground zero for political rhetoric and political journalism, right? Like both sides central <laughs> of America. Um, it used to be missing, this, missing the story because I was reporting both sides. It used to be my entire job every day <laughs> my entire job doing it wrong you know um and i think i've i think i've grown to understand why i was doing it wrong it's what my editors wanted it's all that political journalism was what the republicans say what the democrats say give me a paragraph on what it means um but i also knew once i started to get it a little bit more you know was not the Matrix at all. I know I'm dating myself, but part in the Matrix, it's cool. It's seen it, right? Where the numbers are trickling down, and then he says, he says, for you, it looks like a bunch of numbers. For me, you got to see through it to see what the construct is. Once I could see the Matrix, I started to, it took time and I got it a little bit. Then I realized if I was too critical or maybe too real in some of that reporting, a lot of people in power wouldn't talk to me anymore because they don't want it. And then you hesitate. You say, oh, geez, I want to be able to do this job tomorrow. That's per perfectly understandable. I'm not telling, you know, I would have been crazy to, to, to scream myself out of a job, right? Nobody's going to do that. I don't advocate for that. But if you're asking me a story that I've missed, which one didn't I miss? 
you know, like, I really did. And I have to own it, you know, I, I really do. Um, and I think that our industry, especially in Washington, needs a paradigm shift. And I was part of it. I only know that because I was part of it. I made a living, did my job just fine. I advanced in my career in some ways by not doing my job very well. We got a question here. I I can't answer that question here and now. What I can say is that that's a great way to report the story. Is um, to take an unblinkered view of what the Proud Boys are, what their actions have been. Um, one side, I'm sure, I'm guessing now. I think that one side probably said, "Well, free speech. Got to hear all sides." Right? Got, right? I'm sure that happened. Did it happen? Yeah. Okay. And there's probably, and this is guessing because I've heard that they came, but I don't know much about it. If I'm being honest, um, I think there are probably a lot of students who thought that the presence of the Proud Boys and what they stand for on campus was a threat to their safety, um, not only their psychic safety, but in many ways their physical safety, and that that is an organization that is threatening to their well-being. Um, I think that's the story. Let me take it back on that for a minute, though. Yeah, I'll be right with you. This is advocacy versus an advocate journalist how do you do and it's kind of playing off of the same issue how do you address it and recommendations for students on how they should approach this maybe even a definition of what you think they mean and everything like that um it can be a fine line advocacy advocacy is what it sounds like you fight for a cause or for a group of people or for a political position advocacy journalism does something like that but has different imperatives right demands fact-based reporting demands journalism rejects falsehoods um, demands sourcing and honest analysis but may have a moral stand. I, I advocated at the end of my talk for journalism with a moral core, right? Um, that right and wrong does exist. In my case, um, I've decided that democracy is good, authoritarianism is bad. Okay. That, that voting is good, preventing people from voting is bad, and that telling the truth is good lying as a political strategy is bad and um like again we don't have a rule book and we don't have a pope we have to decide what that advocates for um what values it advocates for i guess it is advocacy journalism of a kind because just doing both sides and having no position on any of these debates and going to the rally in green bay and saying normal political rally by a normal political candidate may uh i think i've made the case this is is not serving anything good so if, if if not doing that and deciding not to do that and declaring that you're not doing that is advocacy journalism maybe it is if we want to label it then that's okay um are you familiar with semaphore because otherwise that's a crazy different question semaphore yeah sure some huh. of my friends work there yeah so i'm curious to know your thoughts on that and how it compares to vice if you think that those sort of outlets um, are an outline for the future of journalism? Semaphore, well, they're just getting started. Um, they've hired, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I mean, 
they have hired some top-notch reporters and top-notch editors. I'm a little biased here because some of them are personal friends, so it might be hard for me to say something totally honest if I think they're garbage, but I don't. I really don't. No, um, they, they've hired some, some really, really great reporters and writers. Um, the editor-in-chief or the founder over there, Ben Smith, has been at the center of some really interesting things in journalism, BuzzFeed. Um, he helped uh, run their news operation um, uh, and was there at some very weird times and, and actually promoted some people who turned out to be pretty awful, um, I think unwittingly. Um, so I don't really know the answer. I mean, I mean, wait, wait and see. I, I do have some trust and support for, for many of the writers that I know that work there and I know how good they are. You know, I'm friends with a guy named Benji Sarlin. Uh, worked at NBC News, is now an editor there. They don't come smarter or better than Benji. Um, I feel like readers are in good hands with him. That's just one example. Um, I'm just going to jump in. We've reached the 7 o'clock hour. So let's say three more questions. And, and by the way, I'm happy to stay, so don't feel. Um, do you think that starting a specialty other than politics helps your reporting in politics? And, or is that a more common path? I don't, uh, it's probably, I don't know if it's more common. In Washington, it's pretty common for young reporters trying to break in to like find a specialty, especially in the trade press. You can get hired cheaper and be willing to really like bust yourself. Um, and then you get exposed to a lot of, that's what happened with me. When I started, it had nothing to do with politics. I kind of fell in love with politics. And I happened to be around it. I said, well, this is what I wanted to do. So I put aside like the medical stuff to like, okay, now I've got to put in the door with all these senators and vice presidents and whatever, and this is what I want to do. So that was the way in for me. In my case, just real quickly, it helped an enormous amount because uh, as John and I were discussing on the way over here, I only got a job in journalism because I knew how to do science stuff. They, when I got hired, they said, take this scientific paper and tell us what it means. And because I could do that, because I was a science major, they gave me a job, $26,000. <laughs> Happy to have it. Well, the back. The back. Um, so my question was just about, you talked a lot about Vice being left-centered. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, you talked about Vice being, quote-unquote, left-centered um, or left of center. Um, and you talked spoke a lot about trust. How do you... Get, how do you convince people that aren't left centered to read your stuff and actually give it a chance rather than just seeing where you're coming from and turning off immediately? Yeah, um, it's, it's a challenge because people never ever have just one influence, right? They're bombarded constantly um, in their feeds with a lot of politically motivated messages. All I can say is watch the coverage uh, one way to do it, and one thing we try to do, is to make the coverage visually engaging and entertaining. You're watching, all of a sudden you're watching, now you're watching. And you don't have to agree with everything. By the way, when I say that Vice is probably situated left of center, that's how I am, if I'm being honest with you, I think that's probably where Vice is perceived. There is no mission in Vice. We never ever discuss it. We're not against, you know, we're not a political organization. I'm telling you that how if, if a, a reader or a, or a viewer were to like line up media outlets on where sort of on the worldview they are, they would probably put Vice there. But that's nothing that we do. I'm just being honest about the way I think people probably perceive the coverage that we generate. But the way to do it is to engage people visually on TV, <coughs> in print. Um, I use jokes, you know, get them into it. And just to the final answer to your question, there's a lot of them because if you look at the comments and the mentions, on YouTube, there's a lot of haters, but they've all watched, okay. and that's great. <laughs> okay, we got these. Maybe the last two questions. Okay, go. Ahead. Um, the foundation of our democracy and the journalistic industry itself it relies on the idea of freedom of the press. Do you think by remaining neutral, journalists are censoring and censoring them, are censoring themselves, ultimately doing a disservice to their function within democracy? Yeah, I, I, I think you, I think you grasp pretty well, kind of the thesis of my talk, that enforced neutrality um, does exactly that. It's, it can be a big construct that actually doesn't serve anyone's, doesn't serve the democracy, doesn't serve the country, most importantly, doesn't serve readers, audience, I should call them audience. It doesn't serve them. 
Um, especially, it really, this is a longer discussion we won't have now. It really never did for all the many hundreds of years or decades when politics was like, tax rate should be 95%. No, it should be 92%. I don't know, I'm just an umpire. It was never great then, really, but now the stakes are even higher. The country is changing, we understand that. Newsrooms are changing for the better, and we understand that. People's perception of what's fair and what's true is changing. And there is, and I say this as a journalist, there is an authoritarian movement that has taken over one of the major political parties. Now that's a story. And if your answer to that story is, I'm just an L, I'm just neutral, you might miss what's really going on. Don't miss it. Your job's not to miss it. Last question in the back. Yeah, you. <laughs> so yeah, I feel like I speak for most people when I say this. But a majority of us, and then the generations younger than us, get all of our information from like social media, such as Instagram, TikTok, things like that. How do companies such as Vice like tend to like keep like expanding their media and staying in business? When I feel like journalism is a dying industry. Journalism is uh, so legacy platforms might be dying. I think you you might be right about that. And you should come and work at Vice right now because this is the debate and the question we have every single day. Um, take TikTok, for instance. I think six months ago, Vice News probably had a thousand followers on TikTok. It's now, I think, two million. We're really focused on it. It doesn't make any money. Haven't figured out how to make money on TikTok, but we figured out where the audience is. They're watching, the views are there, you can count them. So where do you reach your audience? Somebody, to say this not what i do not my problem you know what i mean it is important it's important to keep the company alive it's important to to have a business model and make the stuff work um and they're hard work like a lot of other outlets figuring out how to reach the audience there and then how to monetize it how to make it so that you can stay afloat you know um and so i i think vice has realized that like if you go on vice's TikTok and instagram you'll see um, that it's pretty rich now Got a lot of content. We make a lot of uh, we make a lot of news coverage for those platforms. That hopefully, if you haven't encountered us on TV, which I'm sure you haven't, or maybe not as much on YouTube, which I hope you have or maybe you do, say, "Oh, Vice, I know those guys. That's cool. I did see some cool things. Somebody sends you a YouTube video that actually asks for 17 minutes of your time. You sit down and watch it and get something deep. And I think that I think that's the hope." Todd Zwillick, radio broadcaster, vice writer, columnist, author, says he likes radio more than anything else, he says. I'd like to thank you for coming to Penn State University. I hope uh, you all got something out of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.